I'm Erin Bradner, and I'm going to talk to you today about what happens when that expert network, when that crowd is made up of artificial intelligent agents. I'm here to discuss generative design, and yesterday Peter Diamandis set this talk up very nicely when he said um, he's envisioning a future when he can take a component here, connect it to a component here, and have an AI fill in the space in the middle. That's, in fact, exactly what generative design does. It is the future of CAD. I am from Autodesk, and, and we make software for engineers, architects, um, in media and entertainment. And when the traditionally, when an engineer sits down to a design problem, he or she formulates a solution in, in his mind or her mind and then specifies that in a CAD tool. It's really just a matter of transcribing the idea I have in my head into points and lines and surfaces in a CAD tool. With generative design, I specify my goals and my constraints and I allow the algorithm to find a solution. Not just one solution, but multiple solutions. Here's an example. This is a drone body that my colleague made. This drone body solved against the problem of lift of those four propellers and then the gravity load of the battery. And if it looks a bit like a process of erosion, it is. The algorithm doesn't know where to start when I specify the design. What it does is it creates a block of material, and then it begins eroding that material to satisfy the loads. Once it um, iterates once, it runs an analysis. It runs a stress analysis to determine how well it did at satisfying the loads. If there's still more material it can, it can remove, it removes more. It iterates until it can't remove any more material, any more voxels in one, in one place without adding material elsewhere. And then it begins chasing solutions in other materials, chasing solutions that have um, slightly different geometric constraints, different positions, for example, for that battery housing. Let me give you another example. This is a, one of our interns last summer. What she wanted to do was build, make a chair. And she knew she wanted that chair to be 18 inches off the ground, and she wanted it to support the weight of maximum a 300-pound person. She fed those goals into our generative design tool. The green arrows represent the loads. And she also added what we'll call a no-grow zone. So she wanted to restrict the creative freedom of that algorithm somewhat by telling it where it could grow and where it can't grow. With those inputs, the algorithm explored the space. She said she wanted it to be in aluminum or nylon. It looked at solutions there. Um, and it generated not one, not two, but hundreds of solutions, all that satisfied those goals and constraints. And she ultimately chose to fabricate this chair. Wood and nylon uh, behaved approximately similar, um, and she chose to make it in wood. I think it's beautiful. Now, despite her intelligence, she is a Stanford grad, there is no way that this intern could have explored hundreds of solutions and run stress analysis on every one of those solutions by herself in the few weeks she had to complete this project. So when we think about generative design, think about that crowdsourcing. Think about there being an infinitely large pool of cross-functional teams that you can set out to chew on different approaches to your design problem. And they're all working in parallel. But of course, these are not 
people, these are algorithms, these are processes running in parallel on the cloud. Here's another um, example. This is an engine bracket for GE. The one, the bracket on the left removed weight by optimizing the shape. The one on the right further removed weight by introducing a lattice. And what I like about this lattice is it's not a regularly repeating shape. It's called a variable density lattice. And it mimics bone by adding material where it's needed and removing material where it's not. What I particularly like about this class of algorithms is the body sees this material and it mistakes it for itself. It is so good at mimicking bone in this titanium hip implant that the body will grow into it. It encourages osseointegration. It mimics bone. Now here's another lattice. This lattice, uh, as you can see from the scale, is about 400 um, microns. It is a miniature cantilever. You can't see the whole shape. It's magnified. The approach here is to globally optimize the shape and then introduce these micro lattices. And the beams within those lattices vary in density. Where there is load, the density of those beams is thicker. Where there is not load, they are thinner. And these are micro lattices. And these architectures, these micro architectures, allow us to do two things. We can co-optimize the shape as well as the material distribution. And when we put, I'm working with Lawrence Livermore National Labs on this, and when we put this in an Instrom, in a machine that loads the part, it tells us that the material properties are different across that cantilever, effectively giving us from one feedstock, one material, we're getting different material properties. And it's these micro lattices that give us those different physical properties. Another way to think of this is that we're filling in the white space in material characterization charts like this. The material scientists in the room, anyone will recognize this as an Ashby chart? I get one hand. Um, so you'll, under, you'll recognize that these are known materials and synthesized materials, and they can all be plotted. In this case, this is density against stress, Young's modulus. When we synthesize these micro lattices, we can create material behavior that doesn't exist yet. So yesterday, um, Peter Dimanda said, oh, I want this material to cool at a slow rate. We can create a material that contracts when heated, given the geometry, the right geometry of a micro lattice. And materials don't typically do that. We're moving into this white space on that Ashby chart. All right, so we're moving from the lab now to an application that some of you may have seen. This is from Airbus. This is an internal cabin partition that Airbus worked with us to develop. And it's an example of multi-level optimization, multi-scale optimization. We've optimized the global shape and then optimized the individual beams. So this is a structural partition in a cabin of an A320. The flight crew sits on the jump seats here. And we used an algorithm to satisfy the structural load. And that's where you get these beams crossing. And in fact, it was an algorithm that mimics slime mold growth. And then used a different approach, a different algorithm, to optimize each of those individual beams. 
Um, we looked at structure, and we looked at displacement. We looked at weight reduction, and we looked at maximum displacement. In fact, the, this, um, this partition was optimized to have a maximum of 200 centimeters or 200 millimeters of displacement, which sounds like a lot, almost eight inches, but that's in a 16G crash test. It hasn't run through its crash test yet. It has done a dynamic or a static load, but we are looking, um, we're watching, actively watching for this to pass its, um, its 16G crash test. What is interesting about this is that it is multi-objective optimization. We've optimized for structure and for weight reduction. And that is what an algorithm can do. It can augment our natural native ability to solve against our design problems. It's artificial intelligence augmenting our native human intelligence. Here's another quick example. It's a suspension joint, joint for an F1. In this example, um, our Autodesk's um, software consulting team developed this removed material, the side of that suspension joint using a lattice. And it also, you can't quite see it in the image, but it also created a variable density for that skin algorithmically to satisfy the load constraint and ultimately remove 38% of the weight. And here's an example, nothing particularly stunning about this example. It's a photo I took before I left San Francisco, San Francisco to remind me to tell you about, to admit to, in fact, one of the, um, one of the challenges of 3D printing with metal, and that's how do we certify those parts? How do we certify these highly organic parts that we're printing in metal? And this one is in metal, but it was printed and then it was cast. It's cast in magnesium. And the process that was used to make this is investment casting. The 3D print was used to create a ceramic mold, burnt away, and then the metal print was made. What I like about this is that we have thousands of years of metallurgy to back up our understanding of that piece of metal. And we have engineers and foundries around the world with deep expertise in casting. So when we're generating designs that happen to be these you know, organic, complex shapes, we're not limited to 3D printing. Here's another way to manufacture those shapes, welding. This is a, a robotic welder that we built in our lab in San Francisco. What it's doing is it's watching with cameras, it's watching the weld process. It's bringing in machine learning and generative design to account for any deformation that happens during that weld process. And it's reformulating the shape on the fly. It's a closed loop system. And what it's printed here is another version of that intern's chair. Now, when you watch that video, you can almost see with the human eye where that heat is retained in the print. This is a simulation of a 3D print of a part that we have out in the hall, right here, in fact. Um, and what I like about this simulation is that it shows you in a 3D print process where the heat will be retained and where deformation is likely to happen. Now, it's all a digital simulation. So how about we use intelligent algorithms to predeform the shape, give that digital model that predeformed digital model to the printer, and then print so what we get off the print bed is the net shape. It's the shape we intended. So how about those of you milling? Well, generative algorithms can help you there, too. We're 
introducing, we will be introducing constraints for CNC. So if you have a three axis mill, the shape that the algorithm produces will be made off that three axis mill. Give us the bit and tell, tell us how many axis you have on your mill, three axis mill. The shape that it gives you if you specify a five axis mill will have a bit more geometric refinement to it because the geometries that can be made off a five axis mill are a bit more refined. Now, if you're making the leap to 3D printing, you may be familiar with this example. So again, it's an example from GE. It's a fuel nozzle. And what GE did is they took this part that was originally 18 different components, and they consolidated it into one component. And I share this example with you because when we're pursuing 3D printing and algorithmic design, we're going to get the most benefit not by printing individual parts, but by thinking at the system level and by consolidating multiple parts that otherwise all require sourcing and labor and QA separately into one consolidated 3D printable part. Now, the last example I want to give you is an example uh, we call the hack rod. This is a, a car chassis, a hot rod chassis that we made. What we did was we took an existing chassis and we sensed it. So we put 60 sensors on it. We took the loads as we were driving it. We brought that back to the office. We fed it into our generative design tool. And then that tool returned multiple solutions, three of which we liked. We liked one in titanium, but we didn't have a titanium printer the size of a chassis. Another one we, we liked was aluminum. We just liked the look of that. And we took that back to the team that was going to make it and race it. And they said, we can't do anything with this. Um, we build in chromoly tubes. That's how we work. So we took it back into our algorithm, and we used a beam-based optimization algorithm to create a design that could be welded with different dimensions of 3D chromoly tubes. It optimized for the tools, for the materials that this team was prepared to build in. We still want to make the titanium, um, the titanium chassis. It's not quite there yet. So that chassis, we call it the hack rod because we used algorithms to hack the solution. And it reminds me to ask us all, what happens when we're specifying products, but we don't yet know how those products are going to sense and respond and redesign themselves? And I think one of the answers is we're going to recruit algorithms to augment our natural capacity to design and to engineer. Thank you. <laughs>